Hello and welcome to SEIU Local 521's Stewart Training. I'm Mary Ann from Santa Cruz County and in this video we'll cover labor history. In the United States workers in many industries have come together to form labor unions to gain the voice at work and to participate in collective bargaining with their employer. Collective bargaining allows us to gain better wages, reasonable hours, better benefits, and safer working conditions. Our union membership also provides us with representation in a dispute with management over violations of our contract provisions. In addition to these responsibilities, larger labor unions, like SEIU, typically engage in lobbying activities and campaign at the state and federal level to fight for the needs of our working families. Unions began forming in the mid-19th century in response to the social and economic impact of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution produced a rapid expansion in factories and manufacturing capabilities. But as workers moved away from farm work to factories, mines, and other hard labor, they faced a harsh working condition, long hours, low pay, and health risks. The government did little to regulate these conditions, so the workers took matters into their own hands and formed labor movements to lobby for better rights and safer conditions. National labor unions began to form in the post-Civil War era. The American Federation of Labor, founded in 1886, arose as a loose coalition of various local unions and eventually became a major player in national politics. Shaped by wars, depressions, government policies, judicial rulings, and global competition, the early battles between unions and management were contentious and often marred by aggressive hostility. Unions use several organizing methods to seek better wages and working conditions. Their tactics involved strikes, sit-downs, walkouts, sabotage, and civil disobedience. For approximately 150 years, union organizing efforts and strikes were violently opposed by police, National Guard units, and the United States Army. The United States has had one of the bloodiest labor histories of any industrialized nation in the world. In 1886, Chicago police killed and wounded several workers during a labor strike. In response, workers organized a rally on May 1, 1886 at Haymarket Square to protest the police violence. As the police arrived to dispense the crowd. Someone threw a bomb at them, causing police and civilians alike to open fire. The ensuing chaos resulted in the deaths of seven police officers and at least one civilian. To honor the struggles of the early labor organizers, we celebrate the labor movement on May Day, May 1st of every year. Violent clashes over labor continued into the 20th century. In 1914, the Rockefellers hired private detectives at the Colorado National Guard to end a bitter coal miner strike at Ludlow, Colorado. When evicting the workers failed to end the strike, militiamen attacked the strikers, killing 66 men, women, and children. Can you imagine something like that happening today? The working men and women that came before us struggled to secure so many of the basic rights that we take for granted. It wasn't until 1935 that workers in the United States won their rights to organize. President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the National Labor Relations Act, also known as the Wagner Act, which guaranteed basic rights for private sector employees to organize into trade unions, engage in collective bargaining for better terms and conditions at work, and take collective action, including strike if necessary. The act also created the National Labor Relations Board, which can require employers to engage in collective bargaining with labor unions. It's important to note that the NLRA only applies to private sector employees. It does not apply to workers who are covered by the Railway Labor Act, agricultural employees, domestic employees, supervisors, federal, state, or local government workers 
or independent contractors. After the passage of the NLRA, employers started using arbitration to prevent employees from striking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt and his labor board prioritized the production of war materials and would not tolerate interruptions due to strikes. FDR insisted that arbitration clauses be used to meet the wartime production needs of the country. After the war, however, there was a huge upsurge of labor activity. A wave of national strikes battered the railroad, coal, oil, auto, electrical, telephone, and steel industries. In 1946 alone, over five million workers took to the picket lines. The Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, better known as the Taft-Hartley Act, is a United States federal law that amended the NLRA and restricted the activities and power of labor unions. The Taft-Hartley Act demobilized the labor movement by imposing limits on workers' ability to strike and allowing states to pass right-to-work laws. Despite the misleading name, right-to-work laws hurt workers by limiting our collective bargaining power. Furthermore, Taft-Hartley allowed the executive branch of the federal government to obtain legal strike-breaking injunctions if an impending or current strike interfered with the nation's health or safety. The first law that gave public sector employees in California the right to collective bargaining was the 1968 Myers-Melias Brown Act. The MMBA was signed by Governor Ronald Reagan, who at one time was a union president himself, when he was a member of the Screen Actors Guild. The MMBA made California the second state in the nation to allow public sector collective bargaining. The first state was Wisconsin in 1959. Ironically, Wisconsin's high-profile, wide-scale rollback of union rights in 2011 was carried out by Governor Walker, who cites his admiration for Ronald Reagan as inspiration for curbing workers' rights. Public sector unions are regulated by federal and state laws. Wages and working conditions for public sector employees are determined through negotiations with local and state officials. In recent years, union membership in the public sector has grown because the local government cannot threaten to outsource their work in the way that private employers can. The Public Employment Relations Board, or PERB, is the agency that oversees public sector collective bargaining in California. By 1970s, a rapid increasing flow of imports, such as automobiles, steel, and electronics from Germany and Japan, and clothing and shoes from Asia, undercut American producers. By 1980s, there was a large-scale shift in employment, with fewer workers in high-wage sectors and more in the low-wage sectors. Many employers countered the threat of strike by threatening to close or move a plant. The politics of the 1970s and 1980s favored deregulations and free competition. Union membership among workers in private industry shrank dramatically. Though there remained growth in public sector employee union membership, this trend continues today. Politicians continue to push through legislation to curb the power of public employees, unions, as well as eliminate business regulations. 28 states have now passed right-to-work laws. Vice President Pence is working on strategy to make right-to-work national law. Politicians and employers usually do not explicitly state that they oppose workers' rights. Instead, they've created vague and misleading language campaigns for the right to work. The name is purposefully misleading. Right to work is an agenda to take away rights from the working people. Supporters of right to work laws claim that these laws protect workers from being forced to join a union. But federal law already makes it illegal to force someone to join a union. The real purpose of right to work is to give big corporations more power at the expense of the working families. 
These laws make it harder for working people to form unions and collectively bargain for better wages, benefits and working conditions. Employers love right to work because it really means the right to work for less. Data shows that states with higher levels of union membership have higher median incomes and standard of living. Rising income inequality in the United States can be attributed to part of the decline of the labor movement and union membership. Furthermore, unionized workers are more likely to be covered by employer-provided health insurance and have employer-provided pensions. Unions remain a political force through coalitions with like-minded activist organizations. The labor movement is active in the fight for immigrant rights, trade policy, health care, living wage, campaigns and more. That's it for Labor History. Thanks for watching and please make sure you take the quiz below this video. After you take the quiz, you'll be able to download a handout.